Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey, it's Alan, and I want to introduce you to my brand new, one-of-a-kind, true crime podcast called Uncharted, Crime and Mayhem in the Music Industry. On this podcast, I take you inside some unbelievable stories of murder, plane crashes, court battles, and even run-ins with the mob. In this podcast, you will hear all about the dark side of the world of music. We're releasing new episodes every two weeks, so search for and follow Uncharted Crime and Mayhem in the Music Industry wherever you get your podcasts. Wait, here's a sneak peek. This is from Episode 5. When rock and roll music first appeared in the 1950s, a lot of people were frightened. All this dancing and gyrating and hooting and hollering was labeled the devil's music. It beckoned youth down a dangerous path towards immorality and destruction. It encouraged disrespect of parents and elders. It spat in the face of strong traditional values. And this music could only lead to a rise in godlessness, which of course meant that everyone was going to hell. This kind of opposition was seen across the Western world, but was particularly strong in the United States. Preachers railed from pulpits. Politicians wailed about juvenile delinquents in their music. Rallies were held. Records were burned. And this new music was roundly condemned as the worst thing to ever happen to civilization. For the most part, though, young people ignored this histrionic caterwauling and kept making and listening to rock and roll. The anti-rock crowd grew even more apoplectic, especially with the rise of the counterculture of the 1960s and early 1970s. They blame music for everything from long hair to the sexual revolution to drug use to opposition against foreign wars. Rock fans, though, generally took it all in stride. Yeah, whatever. You're overreacting. Our souls are perfectly safe. I'll tell you what. You do you, and we'll do us, okay? And for about a decade, there was this uneasy divide separating rockers from the religious anti-rockers. Then, in the 1980s and 90s, a portion of society lost its collective mind. To these people, Satan was everywhere in music. His work and influence needed to be exposed and exercised from culture. This wasn't artistic expression. This was Lucifer's sneaky way to seize the souls of the vulnerable, impressionable young. The Antichrist was at work. Evil, demonic forces were everywhere. You just needed to know where to look. And nothing became more important than casting out Beelzebub's rock music once and for all. It was nuts. I'm Alan Cross, and have I got some stories for you. This is Uncharted, Crime and Mayhem in the Music Industry, Episode 5, The Era of the Satanic Panic. Satan is waving, Satan is waving With heroin candy That's a portion of a song by Andy Schoff called Satan, and that's who we're here to talk about. The Dark Lord, Mephistopheles, Diablo, the King of Hell, the Evil One and specifically his attempt to corrupt the youth to the point of eternal damnation through music. There's always that faction of society that's been suspicious and afraid of music, especially music enjoyed by the young or being made by those who want to push the envelope. This is not new. This goes back to at least ancient Greece and probably further. 2,500 years ago, critics were up in arms over the music being made by young people, saying that these sounds would eventually lead to something they called excessive emotionality. They were tut-tutting certain styles of playing that evoked strong passions, something that would inevitably lead to immoral behavior, a decline in discipline, the rise of immodesty, poor character, distraction from intellectual pursuits, and all sorts of irrational thinking. Plato was especially concerned and wrote about it in his work The Republic, he wasn't against music. He knew that it could penetrate to the very core of the self in individuals. In fact, he wrote this, Music is a moral law. 
It gives soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and charm and gaiety to life and everything. Because more than anything else, rhythm and harmony find their way into the inmost soul and take strongest hold upon it. He was also a big believer in using music as a way of educating the young and making sure that they turned into upright citizens. But then he also said this, The introduction of a new kind of music must be shunned as imperiling the whole state. This was directed at the music the young people of ancient Greece were rocking to. Socrates and Pythagoras also had their beefs with the damn kids and their music. This attitude continued over the centuries. In 335 BC, the Greek theorist Aristoxenus of Tartarum proclaimed that any combination of notes that sounded out of tune was unwelcome in music. Cleonidas, a busybody who lived in the 2nd century, also implored musicians to stay away from these unclean sounds. And then after that, a church leader or philosopher would get up on a soapbox every once in a while and condemn the contemporary music of the day, including and especially songs that sounded out of tune. Some believed that anything other than hymns and devotional music was immoral, and there were those who believed that any music would lead one astray and into the pits of hell. Eventually. One of the most infamous cases had to do with Diabolicus Musica, the sound of the devil in music. This was a specific chord that became known as the devil's interval, or if you want to employ some musical theory, a chord known as a flatted fifth, a triad played one chord fret down on the guitar. For example, if we're talking about a G power chord on a guitar, the first finger goes on the third fret of the low E. The third finger goes two frets up to the fifth fret of the A string. The fourth finger goes next to the third on the D string. So there's your fifth. Strumming this guitar gives you a nice pleasant sound. G, D, G. To flatten that, move the third finger to the next fret down so that D plays as a D flat. That introduces dissonance. For some extra oomph, let's hear that on an electric guitar with some distortion. And boom. Cool. There's your devil's triad. And this basic chord construction freaked out religious leaders so much that some of them believed that demons of hell could be summoned just by playing this chord. It was the devil speaking through music. Now, contrary to myth, the Catholic Church never banned the devil's tritone, but they weren't happy about people using it because, well, it sounded weird. That's it. And to be fair, the human brain tends to prefer harmonious sounds. But to some, these chords sounded powerful and cool. To others, the dissonance was too much, too chilling, too evil-sounding. Music was supposed to be pleasing to the ears and the soul, not sinister-sounding. But if you're looking to convey the range of emotions available through music, it's pretty dumb to consciously avoid this particular chord formation. Yeah, such combinations of notes were hard to sing, but that, more than anything, was why they stepped around the devil's tritone whenever possible. But then it did show up in a lot of classical compositions from people like Beethoven, Wagner, Debussy, Liszt, Sibelius, Bartok, dozens of others. When jazz came along, these chords were used a lot, especially when we get to the 1950s with players like Charlie Parker and John Coltrane. And this brings us to Tony Iommi of Black Sabbath. He was a fan of the composer Gustav Holtz, especially his symphonic creation called The Planets, which first premiered in London in 1918. There's a section of The Planets called Mars, the bringer of war. He liked that a lot. It featured a flattened fifth that sounded, um, well, very warlike. Iommi tried it out on his electric guitar, except that he slowed it down and added distortion. In 1970, Black Sabbath released an album called Black Sabbath, that included a song called Black Sabbath. And you can clearly hear Iommi's tritone played with a little bit of a trill.
For some, this is the birth of heavy metal. But we also must credit Jimi Hendrix for bringing the tritone to our attention in 1967 with Purple Haze. The opening is all Devil's Triad. It's cool sounding stuff, right? And as heavy, distorted music took off in the 1960s and 70s, these kinds of chords proliferated everywhere. In addition to a ton of Sabbath and Hendrix songs, they can also be heard in David Bowie's Station to Station, The Beautiful People by Marilyn Manson, Blur and Girls and Boys, Cygnus X1 and YYZ by Rush, Enter Sandman from Metallica. And if not for the Devil's Tritone, we wouldn't have this TV theme song, which is loaded with Diabolicus Musica. Let's go back to the church and their stink eye towards contemporary music. In medieval times, the church tried to control the content and context of lyrics and music as well as the music itself. If it wasn't in line with the religious doctrine of the day, you can bet that it would be suppressed. The same thing happened during the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Secular music was fine, as long as it confirmed to Christian values. If it did not, if it was found to be morally objectionable, songs could be condemned or banned. This continued for hundreds of years, right up until the 20th century. And while the Catholic Church's sway over music declined, many Protestant denominations, especially evangelical churches in America, decided to take up the fight. And this battle really ramped up with the rise of rock and roll in the 1950s. You see, to them, rock and roll had no place in a world of clean living. And these people had power. After the Panic of McCarthyism, the idea that communists, bent on destroying the American way, were embedded in government and other positions of power, put the country on a road to a moral panic that continues to be felt today. In 1956, the biggest variety program on television was The Ed Sullivan Show on CBS. Tens of millions of people watched every week, and Ed had a very good gut for what was going to be hot. That's why he booked Elvis Presley to appear three times. The first appearance on September 9th went off just fine. But the second, airing on October the 28th, caused clutching of pearls because of Elvis's swiveling hips. CBS reportedly received thousands of outraged phone calls and letters, many from religious groups complaining about Elvis's blatant sexual moves. And that's why, for his third appearance on January 6, 1957, Elvis was shown only from the waist up. Meanwhile, there were growing protests about race music, the R&B made by black performers who were finding fans among white kids. This, said many religious groups, not at all concerned about hiding their racism, was corrupting the young white people of America, leading them into juvenile delinquency. There were protests at radio stations, demands to have this music banned, and plenty of events where R&B and rock records were melted in huge bonfires. When the Beatles came along in the early 60s, these same religious groups decried the Beatles' long hair and the overt sexiness in lyrics like, I want to hold your hand. No, really. And when John Lennon made a flippant comment in 1966 about the Beatles being more popular than Jesus, two broadcasters, Tommy Charles and Doug Layton from Birmingham, Alabama, started a campaign to ban the Beatles over this blasphemy, and many records were broken and burned. As 60s counterculture grew, old traditions were pushed aside, much to the shock, disgust, and anger of conservatives. Parents, politicians, and religious groups had no trouble blaming contemporary music, rock and R&B especially, for promoting violence, drug use, immoral behavior, and everything else that their kids were doing or might do. Then, the metal and punk of the 1970s just got them into more of a froth, this music is turning our children into rebellious, disrespectful, and anti-establishment goons. It must be stopped. Punk was singled out because of the music's often angry, nihilistic approach, not to mention the new fashion styles, which were decidedly non-mainstream.
But then we reached the 1980s, and things went completely off the rails, sending some segments of traditional religious society into paroxysms of panic. A satanic panic, in fact. We'll pick it up there in a moment. That's a sneak peek of Uncharted. Hope you enjoyed it. To get the full episode, please search for and follow Uncharted Crime and Mayhem in the Music Industry wherever you get your podcasts. You don't want to miss an episode.